plenty. Was it a but full fly? It was back on tail the really to develop. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm glad you got to do that. <laughs> we got the, the cards at the very last thing when they uh, the local people welcome you back. Oh, okay. Okay. Right at the airport. Okay. Yeah. That's a big number. That was a lot of you know, uh, 100 plus cards. Oh, before. that's cool. And that's really cool. That's very neat. Uh, yes. Wow. Thank you. Oh, thank You're you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love your hat. That's wonderful. Should it be time? Yes. Is your turtle uh, out from under the couch? No, he. Uh, we put him outside last week when it was really hot, uh -huh. and he walked around for a while. And he acted like he was going to wake up, so we put him inside, and he went back to where he's been sleeping. So, yeah, it's a little late. I don't know what's going on. He knows something you don't know. You know, it, he's getting old. <clears throat> there, there is a possibility. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You can spend all your whole life reading about turtles, and by the end is we don't know. We have no idea what they're doing. When we were down with my family, and it's a long day. We, they. There was a uh, bunch of turtles, sea turtles, sea turtles that, uh, and they, they're not allowed, or at the rest, and they had to, they they make these special rooms and everything. These people are just well. When we were there, they had a series of all their buckets. They got to take it out of the bucket and watch these old guys. Oh, they're so cool. And you know, it's they they let the bucket out about the same distance from the the, the sea that or the ocean that they had, that's where their nest was. And I thought, oh, he's out, he's out. He's a little bit. Oh, that is a long way, a long way to walk. And and how did they? How did, how, that's the direction to the water. Yeah, I mean, they're in the middle of this, all this sand. And yet, they all just start up in that direction. They're right up in the sand, then they get to the water. Right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, it's uh, that's one of the things that they say about turtles is that they, they can sense water. So, like, even in, your, like in our house, he doesn't matter where he is. He doesn't have to worry about the emergency room. They just said, wow. So, yeah, it's something. He was on his mini. Right. But how many are lost? Oh, they're all trying to get to this. Oh, yeah. See, we oh, found yeah, four or five miles out. Yeah. And yeah. 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 There are these other nests that didn't have to be moved. We've all waited for them to have to be moved. Ben stopped. Oh, really? We went on a few tasks. There's one that was a little far if you were on these. Sports guy, I have the names of all the guys. Anyway, we went with my brother and stuff, and as you're going down the beach with me, there are fences. They pull the trailer and run. They go in the air to get the fence. They an accident. Right. Uh, they might still go to the Where is it? 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 Where
Yeah, yeah, no, that would not be good. He was like, it's a guy with one arm. I said, yeah, let me show you what I'm going to do. I guess we've they built up so much around. Yeah, no, no, no. She was going to run her door. Come back in three months. Yeah, I'll say, you know, they have a lot of kids. Because they have other other things that come up. So, yeah, I think they protect from the mother. Critters that want to kill my dad, and they could have pretty protected them. So they had to get through a fence. And then it would take six months to get it. Right. Yeah. 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 They either go to his field book church, Holy Cross, but we moved her back. He saw her Thursday and back up with the father. I think she done it. She's not school. She's the way that she teaches the father. She's a little bit older. Oh my God. Uh, it's hard to answer. Okay, so yeah, so Sarah, who was the artist in Texas, she's the one who's engaging in some of it. So we've grown great. Anna's still a homeschooler. I guess she's the one who basically is concerned about it. I don't know if she's bad. It's bad. She just had a call of Tumblr. That's a new one. But honestly, I think they didn't care. I don't see it. Right. See it. It's morning. Morning. How are you? Well, Back in our region, I so Thank you. 
yeah. Yeah. And then, then of course, right by the yeah. by the yeah. challenge. Right. The, the it's it's interesting, you know. Hi, Dean Pam. All right. Well, I think it's about time. So there you go. We got our church early, so that means we get more time to study, right? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to Bible study. Um, Michelle's not here, but I think we have a blood drive this weekend, right? Or this week? Yes. Wednesday, 2.30 to 7. So show up if you can. You can get blood. Bring your veins. Bring what? Bring your veins. Bring your veins. Yeah. And your arteries. <laughs> we gotta get blood to them. Um, all right. So I don't know what else is going on. It's confirmation this after this late service. So if you want to come back and watch confirmation, that's cool. Um, yeah. Anything else? Just enjoying the new sanctuary, isn't it great? Isn't that nice? That's good. What's that? So nice, isn't it? I know it's so nice. I feel like I need to think something. Yeah, we should have a we should have a party. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you're welcome. welcome. I worked hard. It was up all night. Are the are the rails coming in? Do we know? It'll probably be a month or so. Yeah, month or so. Astrid, Astrid. Yeah, Pastor Asbury at Hope is working on the woodwork, so which is pretty cool. So that's crazy fun. He's All right, in, uh, Kevin. Susan. Uh, the story I heard from Pastor Sell was that he wanted to wait until the construction was complete to make sure it all custom fitted. Ah, yes, that makes sense. We don't want to redo those things. No. Yeah. That's <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's let's get to it then. We're going to read Romans eight today. Um, and study how this, how this kind of, how Paul does this. Very interesting things ahead. So let's let's pray, and then we'll get to our study. We pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, as you call us to this blessed place around your holy word, we pray that you'd bless our gathering this morning with your Spirit. That as your Spirit is among us, we would walk according to your will. That we would read these words as you desire, and then all things we would see Christ. In His name, we pray. All right, so um, let's see. Well, let's just read. Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. Let's read it. Romans 8, 1 to 11. Someone read that for us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life is set in place in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law we did by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of the flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the right requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is cast out to God, for it does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. 
Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, that's good stuff, isn't it? Isn't that fun? There's a lot to say about this, so we will spend a little bit of time on this. And then um, as you look at the rest of Romans 7, we'll see how he develops some of these issues throughout the rest of the chapter. So, all right, number one. So how is this different than seven? Yeah, it's kind of law and gospel, right? So seven is kind of law, and eight kind of sounds like a lot of gospel. <clears throat> Now it's not pure law and gospel. There's some obvious gospel everywhere and law everywhere. But this kind of it's kind of right. Set Romans 7 is really Paul looking at himself. And when he looks at himself, what does he see? He sees sin. Romans 8, he's going to look at the spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. And what does he see? He sees life. And this is the big turn. Is he's in a, and this is a very important thing as you read through the book of Romans is when we when we focus on us, we're always going to end up saying, okay, all I see is sin. That's what I see when I look at myself. But when I see what God is doing in his Holy Spirit because of Christ, there I see life and forgiveness and peace. Okay, so what makes the change is how does a sinner get life, right? How does that happen? Well, that's obviously we know that through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so this is what he's going to point the church to is look at verse two. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So that's kind of our transition is when we talk about the spirit in chapter eight, we're really talking about the Holy Spirit which is the life-giving spirit that sets us free from sin and death, right? Does that make sense? And that's, I know it's its easy to see, but it's just, it's a major theological idea. And this is really how Lutherans kind of read the Bible as a whole, is that there are things in the scripture that reveal the truth about us, and that's going to be to reveal our sinfulness. And then there are other parts of the Bible that are going to talk about what God has done on our behalf in Christ and how the Holy Spirit gives us faith in that. And that really is going to be the parts that point us to what we call the gospel. Okay. The good news. God's good. Does that make sense? Now, as I've told you guys before, and, and I'm not taking credit for this, but it did happen after I talked about it. Um, on the way here, we used to drive by a church called champions church. It's closed. Oh, no. Apparently they did not win. <laughs> I don't know what they were champions of. All it was just where it was at one forty one and uh, forty four. The old steak and shake, yeah. Which I think they should have kind of you know thought through a little bit. <laughs> we're gonna buy an old steak and shake. That worked out really well for them. Anyway, champion church is closed, which I think is is kind of. I'm sorry for them, but not really. Um, but it, it continues to be a fascination of mine. Is that when I buy, I drive by churches. Just look at what the names of new churches are. It's it's never about God. <clears throat> All these new names are about you. us, yeah. what we're doing, who we are. See, you don't come to church to talk about you. If you do, it's going to be a really miserable experience. We come to church to talk about Jesus and what God has done. Yeah, I know it's a Sunday school answer, but it's always the right answer. And don't ever forget it. When you are on your deathbed, you know what word you're going to want to hear from your pastor? Jesus. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He is forgiveness of sins. He alone does those things. And the church is always tempted, always tempted to say, oh, no, we're a community. We need to focus on us being community. 
Well, guess what? No. That's not going to do anybody in this room any good. Except for Rob. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a thing going on now that people say, I am the church, so I don't need to go to church. It's a devilish twist. It's a devilish because why? It's false. Because it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> because Jesus isn't there. Right. Where, where is he? But, but they've taken that I am the body of Christ, so I don't need to go there. It, it's it's a miserable, it's really a plague. Really. It really is. So it's really coming to the church. Yeah. And the plague time really bumped that up. Yep. Yeah. And we're still kind of trying to recover from that. Now, it's really interesting to watch what's happened is those who get like what church is, they're so happy to be back in person and, and those kind of things. Those who really never understood church, COVID was their excuse to never come back, like to just never come back. And, and it's kind of really interesting to watch this. Even pastors are kind of like, hey, this is great. We don't ever need to gather again. It's like, oh, wait, not Missouri Center. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, this is a problem. And, and this is part of the issue is when Paul says, I look at me and all I see is sin and death. What do Americans see when they look at themselves? How awesome I am. I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I'll take selfies and post them online. So everybody can see me. See, and see what's happened is, therefore, when the church walks up and says, good news, Jesus has rescued you, and they say, I didn't need rescuing. Matter of fact, I'm offended at the idea that I would need rescuing. That's what I hear. How dare you suggest to me that I need somebody's help? I've actually been told that. That's oppressive for you to say that I need God's help. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And we're living in a society that doesn't want rescue because they don't think they need rescue. Right? Therefore, why come to church? I'm doing fine on my own. And this is a huge issue. And this is really what Paul's getting at in Romans as well, is that in, in the church at Rome, you have two factions of people that are kind of trying to figure this out. And you know what the issue is? Identity. The Jews are saying, Jesus is great, We'll just fit him into our identity as Jews. See? And the Gentiles are saying, Jesus is great. He'll fit into our identity of being Gentiles. And Paul says, your identity is the problem. You need to get rid of your identity and only be identified as being in Christ. Right? What's the issue today? The identity. It's all about identity, right? And what do, you, what do you see churches trying to do? Trying to say, you can keep your identity and we'll just kind of slide some Jesus in too. Well, guess what? That ain't work. <clears throat> what we need is Christ in him crucified. I was talking with somebody kind of about the identity situation recently and the response that came back from them was that the Bible is open to interpretation. Hmm? That's exactly right. So what did pastor preach on today in a sermon? What did he say? The word is so much. Right, the word. We come here not to tell God things, but to hear from God, right? To be shaped by his word. So then what do they say? No, I'm going to shape the word. See, this whole excuse of, well, it's just up to interpretation. is just an excuse to say, I'm not going to let the Bible tell me things. I'm going to tell the Bible what it must say. The hardest thing to do, the hardest thing to do for you, for me, is to let the Bible shape us. We're always tempted to open the Bible and say, I'm going to find a verse that says what I think is true. Oh, look, I found one. See, I'm right. No, we open the Holy Scriptures to be shaped by God. 
You come to church to be shaped by God. You don't come here telling God what's up. He tells you. Right? And what's up is two major things. Law and thankfully gospel. So God's going to tell you two things that are really true. About you, you're a sinner. That's what's about us in the service. And that's what's about us in the service. Okay? And they're going to tell... And then your pastor is going to remind us what God has done. And that's what's about Jesus in the sermon. Now, here's the other great problem is a lot of churches are making what God has done, not about Jesus, but about us. God is love. Therefore, the church will save the world by loving it. See what they just did? They took the part that's supposed to be what God is doing and they removed it from Christ and they put it on us. So then you walk around and you go, well, the church ain't doing so well, are we? Right? What golf tournament is going on this weekend? The Masters. So the Masters has this uh, par three contest. You heard of this? It's on Wednesday, right? Is it on Wednesday? Some golfer in here would know. So on Wednesday, they have this par three contest. It doesn't count. It's not an actual competition. The, the players have their kids and stuff caddy for them, and they just whack the ball around this little par three course, right? So they have a lot of holes in one. It's really fun. I They had it on TV. We don't watch the things. We're, we were watching it, okay? <laughs> Actually, I was, I was working on something it was on. But here's my point. They, it, was it was packed. This is something that doesn't even count for anything. It's just people hitting golf balls a lot of times in the water. It was packed. People paying thousands of dollars to get in there, let alone the tournament this weekend, which when I lived in North Carolina, I tried to go. It was $1,500 a person, and then you had to pay to get in. It was crazy, right? And that place, they're turning people, literally turning people away. We have empty tables. We have empty pews. And this is the whole issue is that the church, the church needs to be about Jesus. And when the church is not about Jesus, she loses her identity. So when you come to church, you don't come to hear about you and what you're doing to help God. You're coming to church to hear what God has done for you. And then you take this out, and tomorrow morning when you wake up, you say, the most important thing in my life is not me and what I'm doing. The most important thing in my life is what God has done in Christ Jesus for me and for my neighbor. See, that changes everything, right? That's what Romans 8 is going to get at. So, Looking at ourselves, what do we see? Wretched man I am. Who will save you from this body of death? Looking at what God has done in Christ Jesus, what do we get? Romans 8. You are marked by the spirit of life who dwells in your midst. Isn't that fun? Okay. Is it fair to say when, um, like, you're talking about the ball and the empty seats and the um, basketball and, you know, you have the final floor and just finish up. Like, are we missing opportunities? Like, I always have those moments where people give the glory to God when they're receiving. Like, yeah. I just think it's important that we don't miss those opportunities. Right. When we maybe outside make that part of your conversation. Well, that you can take yeah. those opportunities because some people do that very well, and other people are very good at. I worked very hard. I, and they don't. In my yeah. opinion, they miss that opportunity to right. throw that in there. That right. will, you know. No, I think that's right. And so that's part of what church does. It shapes our language of how, to, where do we give credit when things go well? Right? I mean, I, this is not made up. This is actually a very true story. We flew to Texas on Thursday because my daughter had to move, was going to move home. Loaded up all of her stuff into the, some rental awfulness, Right. When you rent vans one way, they give you the vans they don't want to need. 
right? So we're leaving Lubbock, Texas in the van that nobody wants it. <laughs> it's, it's awful, yeah. right? It's just awful. And we drive all the way through. I, have you ever, ever heard of Texas? <laughs> you can drive for three days and still be in West Texas. It's insane. It, the road just never ends. You just go and go and go. And you can go as fast as you want. It doesn't matter. There's nobody out there. You just go. <laughs> Unless you're in a rental truck, then you only go as far as fast as the truck will come let you go. So we, get, we drive all the way through all of Texas, all of Oklahoma, all of Missouri, which, by the way, Missouri is not really that much fun to drive through. <laughs> when you start in Joplin and you have to go all the way at 44. It's just, I mean, it's pretty. But it's wait, no, it's not. <laughs> I think that's law. I know. So we get there. We 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 drive all this way, right? Eight hundred and fifty miles or so. We get to one forty one and forty four, and we get off. And at the bottom of the exit ramp. There's a man laying in the median. Yes. Right in front of us. Oh, wow. And I turned to Robin and I said, I am such a good driver. We didn't get an accident the entire time. That's what she said. Do you think that makes any sense? No. Glory be to God that he brought us home safely. And Lord's mercy on that family. See, we, we learn to live our lives not looking at, oh, I was successful because I did something wonderful. Whenever anything good happens, we are, we are humble and we receive mercy from the Lord's hand. And we pray that same mercy be poured out on other people, right? Does it make sense? And I look back, I literally look back over all 850 miles and I thought, you know what? We were this close about 20 times from being that famous. And I don't understand how God does stuff. I don't understand how angels work. But praise God for his grace and his mercy, right? Does it make sense? I think that's what Romans 8 does. It helps us see life from the viewpoint of God working on behalf of his people. Right? And I want to be identified as one of his people. I know I don't deserve it. I really don't. But if he'll have me, I want to be identified as one of his people. And Paul says the way to be identified as one of his people is to have faith in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's Romans 8. Honestly, that's that's the point of it. Okay? Any questions or thoughts so far? I was thinking we should all constantly pray to carry it. Yes. I said it right. Yeah. Lord yeah. Have mercy. Lord have mercy should be our constant prayer. Always. Always. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Matter of fact, it, it is my favorite prayer. It's also short. It's hard to forget. Easy. Yeah. And you have close. You don't have to close your eyes when you pray. By the way, <laughs> a lot of people you pray when you drive. Yes, but I don't close my eyes. I let Robin close her eyes for me while I'm driving. <laughs> I'm going to hold your hands. Or hold my eye. We're on 10 and 2, right? All right. So, number two. So, who has overcome our problem with the law? Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is important. I know you guys, you guys know the answers too well. But just think about this for a second. When Martin Luther grew up, the answer was the church, the pope, or you, Martin. you got to fix your life. When I was in high school, my friends that weren't Lutheran, they were really on fire for Jesus. You know what their witness was? you got to clean up your life and then accept Jesus. That's what they told everyone. And I'm going, that's not how it goes. I was raised Lutheran. I go to all these weird Bible studies. They're like, if you need to repent, stand up. I'm like, oh, that's me. And my friend's like, sit down. You don't need to repent. You're already a Christian. And I'm like, what are you talking about? See, they had this whole idea that Christians were those who had already cleaned up their life. They had already overcome the problem of the law. But guess what? They're a bunch of hypocrites. Aren't they? 
aren't you? See, Lutherans aren't any more sinful than anybody else. We're just better at admitting it. So he walks up and says, the church is terrible. It's corrupt. It's full of sinners. And we go, yeah, and that's just early service. Uh-huh. You should see late service. <laughs> right? I mean, like, it's that's just the way it is. And so the, the whole point, look what, but just think about this for a second. So God gives his law. Let, let's go look at it. Let's go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Book of Exodus is the second book of the Bible, right? Genesis is a prologue to Exodus. Best way to think about it. Genesis is a prologue to Exodus. Yep, give me that look. I know. It's true. The whole point of Genesis is to get us to Egypt. So that God can do what? Set us free. Read the rest of the Bible. That's what it'll tell you. The whole of Genesis is a prologue to Exodus. Read it correctly, it'll make sense, all right? So Exodus 19. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, they set out from Rephidim, and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped to the wilderness there, Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to Moses out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Remember, Jacob and Israel are two of the same word, right? Okay. That you shall say to the house of Jacob and to all the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples and all the earth is mine, and you shall be in a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the, the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered him together. All the Lord has spoken, we will do. Right? Sounds great. So then what happens is he's going to give him the law. Okay? So Exodus 20 is giving him the Ten Commandments. Now, what happened in the rest of the Old Testament? They never kept the law. They never even came close to keeping the law. Right? What God do? He forgave them sometimes, but he sent Jesus eventually. But in the Old Testament, what did he do? Wrath! He smushed them. He smote them. There's all kinds of Old Testament words, right? All the stories of the Old Testament, God smashing people. Exiled. Exiled them. He gave them stuff and then took it away because Israel didn't deserve it. He gave them more laws. How'd that work? Not great. He gave them a king. How'd that work out? Not so great. He gave them priests. How'd that work out? Not so great. They built the temple. How'd that work out? Not so great. All that you say we will do. The rest of the book is them doing nothing according to the word of the Lord. Which means God is not obligated to be their God. And they no longer have a reason to exist. Israel only exists because God has saved them. And therefore, they only exist in order to do the will of God. When they stop doing the will of God, they cease having a reason to exist. Does that make sense? And instead of being a people of life, they become a people of death. Israel tried for thousands of years and all they did was fail. So Allison, what did God do? So he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to do what God's people are unable to do. And that is keep the law. Right? And this is very important for you. Are you able to keep the will of God, the law of God? No. Is Jesus? Yes. Mm-hmm. If you are judged based on your ability and your actions, how are you going to do? Terrible. If you are going to receive what Jesus did, how are you going to do? Great. Okay. And this is exactly the point of the gospel is that you have a problem because you can't overcome God's law. 
it will always condemn you, no matter what. Even if you think you got it licked, it'll condemn you. So why does he say in Exodus the if part? Like, if you keep my commands, you will. Well, obviously, yeah. well, I guess we know now, but like, it, it sounds like you keep that if, and then that conditional wasn't kept, then shouldn't he have smushed everybody? Yes, that's exactly right. So the bilateral covenant, he says, I've done my part, yeah, right? They didn't. Yeah. You do your part. They said, that sounds great. What they should have said is, how about we don't do this? How about we have some kind of arrangement where it's all on you? Right? That would have been a better response. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, we can we can do whatever you tell us. No problem. He's like, okay, go for it. Go for it. Try it. 2,000 years later, not so great. See, so what happens is, this bilateral covenant is actually God explaining to his people that they need God's grace and mercy alone. That's what it's teaching them. And so in Jeremiah 31, he says, I'm going to make a new covenant that isn't bilateral, but instead the new covenant will be defined by the forgiveness of sins. And that'll be the only covenant that matters is this new covenant that is the forgiveness of sins. So when Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, he's saying this covenant is no longer how God and his people interact. It's not. It's over. That covenant is over. Now, God interacts with his people unilaterally. Right? You risked the bottle. I did. Just put a uni. It was the Holy Spirit. No, my hand. no it's actually just my hand. Right? It was never it was never by because God's people could never keep it. So wasn't it always you know that? That's what he's gonna reveal is that so what happens is what we learn is that when we when we think about God and our relationship to God, the direction doesn't go this way. Right. And the bilateral cover will make this thing it goes this way, but it doesn't, right? Oh, now I gotta start back with pen. That's what we're gonna learn. And this is that. Because it's not just how we relate to God, it's literally God becoming man and dying and rising. And so what we see is that this is actually Genesis 1 to 2. Genesis 1 to 2 is a revelation of God, man, and this is all pointing to the time when God becomes man. So it's a long journey from Genesis 1 and 2 to the death and resurrection of Christ, right? Thousands of years. And then it's going to be a long journey from the death and resurrection of Christ to the second coming, right? I don't know why God takes so long, but he does. But God's love under the old covenant was was his love dependent on uh, he still loved Israel even though they broke everything. These are the words you shall speak to the, the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the house of slavery. That's how the Ten Commandments start. So God has always been identified as the one who acts to save his people. That's who he is. And as long as God's people think that their importance and their worth is found on their ability to do things. They're mm -hmm. always going to miss this, that. What he's teaching them is you are always dependent mm -hmm. on me for everything. And that's not bad news. That's good news. Okay. I don't know why he did it the way he did it. That's yeah, just yeah. The nature of God is love, correct? The, yes. So the character of God is love. Yeah. So, so what happens is, I mean, this is our, our epistle reading today, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should become the children of God. Right? See what kind of love. Well, what kind of love did he give us? A love that has demands? I think it's important to see, though, that that bilateral covenant didn't go away. It's fulfilled. It's fulfilled in Jesus, the man. 
so that everything is fulfilled there and then all our benefits go out of Jesus. Yep. Okay, so what happens is the bilateral covenant that establishes Israel as God's people is actually fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He does what Israel was unable to do. So what does he do after his, he's, what does he do to be baptized? He's baptized where? We were having this discussion, Craig. Where was he baptized? Jordan. In the Jordan River. Where? How did Israel enter into the promised land? The Jordan River. This is great, right? So Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, and then he goes where? Into the wilderness. That's totally backwards. Israel went from the wilderness across the Jordan and the Promised Land. Jesus is born in the Promised Land, crosses the Jordan, and then goes into the wilderness. Well, how did Israel do in the wilderness? Not great. How did Jesus do? Perfect. Now you're getting it, right? Now you're seeing how Jesus is the fulfillment of the whole idea of the people of God. He is Israel in one person. So all the things that God commanded, does Israel keep them? No. Or? Yes. Yes, in Christ. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. See? So covenant made, covenant kept. That's why Paul says he's wiped out the handwriting of the law against him. Right. So it's, it's all fulfilled right there. So now, what is the church doing? Are we trying to say Jesus didn't fulfill the law, so we need to do what he was unable to do? No, that would be that would be not believing what Jesus did. Instead, we say we believe the entire law is kept. There's nothing left for us to do. Right? And imputed to us. And, and this is given to, well, given to you as righteousness. But when it comes to the law, what part of the law is left undone? None. So what does God need you to do? Nothing. Nothing. So when you showed up today, God was like, Shoo, sure glad they came. I was dying without them. No. He doesn't need you. There's nothing that he needs you to do. Nothing. Right? So there's a there's a guy, he's an old man, he's a widow or whatever a guy is, right? And his son comes to him and says, Dad, I need to borrow some money. Okay, son. So he lends him some money, and the boy goes out and buys his dad a gift with the money that he borrowed from his dad. Gives the, the gift to his dad. Did the dad get richer in that exchange? Depends on how you define rich. Did he materially get richer? No. So when God gives you everything, what do you do with it? You serve him. You love God and you love neighbor. With all the stuff that he's given you. Not to fill, not to fulfill the law, to keep, to fill up what God was unable to do in Christ, but to say, because it's all been kept in Christ, I'm free. I'm free from sin, right? I don't have to sin anymore. God set me free from that. I'm also free from my obligation to the law. I'm not waking up and everyone going, oh, in order for God to be pleased, I've got to do all these things. No, you're free. It's all been kept in Christ. Now you get to do whatever God has given you to do today. To his glory and to serve neighbor without any concern of trying to fulfill the law. Right? It makes me think of in Acts where everybody had everything in common. Yes, Acts Sold 4. Everything. We read it last week and now we're going to go back to read Acts 3, which is kind of weird. We don't want to read Acts 5. So Acts 4 ends great, right? Everyone's selling everything, houses and fields, and giving to the apostles, and nobody has any need. 
What's Acts 5 about? Ananias and Sapphira. Right? I was I was at a um I was at a Whataburger. I was. Whataburger. Because we were in Texas. That's what you do when you're in Texas? Get a Whataburger. They're pretty good. They're really good. What a burger. What a burger. It's kind of like if you've been in California, you have in and out burgers. Whataburger is the Texas version of in and out which is Missouri, we have closed steak and shakes is what we have. We have closed steak and shake places where you drive by and say, that used to be a steak and shake. Their fries were decent. It took 20 minutes to get a meal, but it was the fries were decent. But I was at Whataburger and, and a young man said, what do you learn about yourself in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Didn't talk to me. Unfortunately, I wanted to answer. <laughs> what do you learn about yourself in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? A savior. We need a savior. See, it's really interesting. What do you learn about yourself? And the answer is nothing. We learn about what God has done to preserve his church. In Acts chapter 4, what's the story of Acts chapter 4 about? Is it about that you're supposed to go sell your house and give to the poor? No, it's about the apostles. Acts 1 through 4 is about the apostles, even in 5. It's about the apostles. Acts 1 through 5 is establishing the, the, the apostles are God's guys on earth. And if you stand against the apostles, what happens? You die. And if you're with the apostles, what happens? You have no needs, and you get healed, and you get forgiveness, and you hear the word of God. It's about the apostles. See, and this is the point, is we are so tempted to read the whole Bible as though it's about us. But Acts chapter 4 says this, no one had any need because everyone brought to the feet of the apostles, and what did the apostles do with all this wealth they accumulated? They bought a private jet. No, what did they do? They distributed it to the church so that nobody that was part of the church had any need. See, that's what the apostles do with worldly wealth is they, they do what with it? Serve their neighbor. Right? Right? Acts chapter 5. If you lie to the apostles, it's like lying to the Holy Spirit and you will die. So what happens is we start seeing this in the, in the whole Bible. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is that, what does that have to do with you? Answer? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What actually happened is, this is the point of the book of Daniel, by the way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? You guys heard of them? Fiery furnace guys? Veggie yep. tail, <laughs> Rack Shack, and Benny? Yeah, very good, okay? Actually, one of the better ones. One of the better ones, right? Nebuchadnezzar is a giant pickle. It's just better to think of life that way, isn't it? Go through life thinking Nebuchadnezzar is a giant pickle. Um, Rack Shack and Benny, in this case, Betty Taylor, you heard of it? Is it just aberration of life that happened, but it's preserved something weird. So we can live with it. Um, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not their names, right? Those are their given, those weird names. Um, what happened in 601 BC is Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem. And the way that the Babylonians conquered other nations was they took away their smartest young men. They took them from the nation they were going to conquer and brought them to Babylon and indoctrinated them in Babylonian thinking. What does that mean? The next generation of bright young people in this world will all be thinking Babylonian thoughts. Okay? That's how Nebuchadnezzar did it. This, the Assyrians conquered in a very different way. We won't get to that because it's awful. But that's how the Babylonians conquered. Their first wave of attack was they took over a city and then they identified the smart young men and they took those young, they left everybody else there, just took the smart young men. That's why I was left behind, right? They came in and they looked at me and they're like, that was a break, ain't gonna get taken, right? So we're, so if I'm not in Rack Shack and Benny, I'm the guy back in Jerusalem going, I guess I didn't make the cut. And, and the issue is they take these young men. Now, read Daniel. Read the first couple of chapters of Daniel. What's it all about? Four guys. 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And they are constantly under attack to be indoctrinated as Babylonians. But what happens? They resist. They continue to be faithful to Yahweh. And what is this telling Israel? It might look like you're being conquered. But God is always preserving a people for himself. Always. By his grace. Right? That's what Rakshak and Abednego is all about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is all about the fact that God is being faithful to his promises to preserve his people. So you look around the world today and you think this world is going to, well, at least purgatory, right? In a pinto. Someone's got right, to have alliteration somewhere. And you look around. I mean, just look at the news. And it's like, are there even any Christians left? Look at the churches. Are there any Christians left? And what do we say? God. And he says, I'm preserving a people for myself. Don't lose heart, right? Don't lose heart. And don't become indoctrinated with America. Don't become an American. That'll kill you, right? You're going to have to resist. You're going to be taught this all day long. You're going to eat at the king's table. All these metaphors, right, that, that actually happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Daniel. What happens? God preserves them in their faith. Through his word, through his holy sacraments, he preserves his church. So Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, finally prays to the Lord. He says, God, we are in exile because of our sin. Don't let this exile remove us from you. Right? Restore us. And that's what the church prays today. Let us not be indoctrinated by the world, but let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I want to know how the person asked me a question about what all about that. Well, I don't know. I didn't hear the rest of it yet. I just heard him asking his friend. I didn't hear the response. I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a little Bible study here? I would, That's actually what I thought. Wouldn't this be fun to say, it's really about Israel and God preserving it? Runs. They'd be like, I was kind of thinking I should stand up for my faith. I'm like, yeah, that's nice too, but that's not what the story is about at all. You're not Shadrach, Lee, Jack, nor right? I've heard this way too many times in my life. I'm like, uh, I'm Shadrach. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not. Right? Okay? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually am. <laughs> so, so, um, so, as, as we look at number two, who has overcome our problems of law? This is the point, is, is that Paul is, is driving the, the focus of God's people away from themselves, even in the keeping and doing of the law, to Christ <clears throat> Jesus, okay? And this is, this is a huge change in the book of Romans, is that when Romans 7, we're talking about Paul's inability to keep the law, now he's going to point the church to Christ Jesus himself as the one who keeps the law. So look at verse three. For God has done what the law, weak and mighty flesh, could not do. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. How is the law fulfilled in us? By the sinning of Jesus. So you get the kept law as though you did it when you didn't do anything. Christ did it, and that's given to you as a gift. That's righteousness. Okay? Cool? We lost people online. I don't know what, I don't know what happened. That's okay. They'll come back. Number three, what does Paul mean by in Christ? So look at verse two. For the law of the spirit of life sets you free in Christ Jesus. I want to pause this because this is... We've talked about this briefly, but I just want to kind of make sure we're all understanding this. This is Paul's way of talking about, I don't know, what do you say? Being saved, being a Christian, being a Lutheran, kingdom of God, whatever you want to call it. This is his little phrase 
to talk about what it means. This is how you identify a Christian. They are in Christ. Okay? <clears throat> so you think about verses like Romans chapter 6. You are baptized into Christ, into his death and resurrection. Well, he'll also say that we live in Christ, right? So think of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this whole idea of being in Christ is, ball, is Paul's way of talking both justification, which is about how we're saved, and sanctification, which is how we live. Okay, so justification is how we are saved, forgiveness of sins, and sanctification is how we live because we are justified. For Paul, that's all in Christ. So as you read through Romans or you read through Ephesians, read through Galatians, you're going to hear this phrase, in Christ. It's, it's over 210 times in Paul's 13 books. It's I say over because it's kind of hard to figure out. Not everyone agrees on every phrase that fits in this category. But he says it a lot of different ways. But overall, this, this whole idea of in Christ is a big deal. Okay. And this is really Paul's way to talk about stuff. <clears throat> when you read the Synoptic Gospels, you're going to read the term kingdom of God. And that's their big way of talking about what yeah, Jesus yeah. came to do. For Paul, it's in Christ. Okay? So what Paul is going to get at in Romans chapter 8 is when you look at your life in Christ, life in Christ is done by the Spirit. You are in Christ by the Spirit. Right? How do you get into Christ? Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? He's trying God. So when you speak about one, you speak about one. It's all going to fit together eventually. As a matter of fact, it all fits together <clears throat> in verses 3 and 4. For God has done what we can by the, the law, we by the flesh could not do by sending his own son. So that means the God in verse in verse three is the father because he's the one that sends his son, right? So you have father and son. And then what you have at the end of verse four, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, so it's a Trinitarian idea for Paul. All of this in Christ is a always a Trinitarian idea. Now, this is important. Let's just let this get there for a second. How do we get in Christ? This is this is the big issue of theology. I know you guys know this, but just to kind of review and to make sure you understand what's going on. <clears throat> How do you get, if in Christ is this good stuff, if you're in Christ, you get eternal life, you get forgiveness of sins, you get all the good stuff. How do you get in Christ? See, that's that's the big issue of theology. How do you get to be in Christ? Word and sacrament. That's fine. That's nice. That's the right answer. But who's doing the work? The Holy Spirit. What would most Christians say? I made the choice. I made the choice. I accepted Jesus in my heart. Or if they're Catholics, I did much I'm, keep, I'm trying. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I'm going to keep trying and hope. Right? What would a Calvinist say? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Right. I don't know. <laughs> it was all determined before the creation of the world. And I'm hoping when I look at my life, sometimes I see evidence that says I'm one of the chosen. Sometimes I see evidence that I'm not. <laughs> I'm still hoping. See, they'd say it's all by, by the spirit and by grace, but they'd say, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know. And they would, at the end, they would say, it's determined by the evidence of my life. And you say, well, according to that theology, Paul is condemned. Because when Paul looks at the evidence of his life, what does he say? What a wretched man I am. See, what we say is, when it comes to determining whether or not I'm in Christ, I'm going to say, this is all up to God. And I'm not going to look at my life at all for evidence. I'm going to point to what God has done. Right? Kevin? 
<laughs> it's, it is I. Uh, would not that in Christ start at your baptism? Good. So now when do we talk about this beginning? When did when did God put you into Christ? Baptism. So what do you say? I'm baptized. How do you know you're saved? Well, I'm baptized. I say, oh, baptism is a church thing. You say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Baptism is how God puts me into Christ. That's how he did it. Does the Bible say that? Yes. Over and over and over again. How then shall we? Shall we? Peter, we had this again in, in Acts chapter 3. We, uh, we had some of this. But, but in Acts chapter 2, Peter says this even more uh, uh, earlier explicitly he says he says the people listen to him preach you killed the son of god and they say uh oh how should we be saved and he says be baptized into the name of jesus christ see baptized into and this is the whole idea is baptism is the way the holy spirit moves us into christ jesus what's another way hearing the word hearing the word the Holy Spirit works in the word to give us faith in Jesus Christ, right? In Jesus. And this is the point is when you hear the word, the Holy Spirit works. Another way is the Lord's Supper, right? When you eat and drink the Lord's Supper, you are in Christ. And so what we say is when someone says, are you a Christian? You say, yes. You say, well, what about, you know, I know you. You're not that great at being a Christian. And you say, that's not, that's not how this works. God is really good at making Christians, Right? So I'm putting all my eggs in the God doing good stuff basket and zero eggs in the Kevin doing good stuff basket. Does it make sense? And that's exactly what, what the scriptures and Paul is teaching us in Romans chapter 8 is to say, don't look at yourself. Look at what God has done in Christ Jesus to determine who you are. Um, the, the phrase... Believe and be baptized, and we shall be saved. It sounds like there's an imperative there for mm -hmm. you to believe. Well, it's actually repent to be baptized there. It's even worse. It's even more action. But that's the stumbling block that we have talked about uh -huh. numerous times. In yeah. It and sounds like I've got to do something. Right. I have to believe. And the whole point is that's right. You have heard the word, right? So you've heard the word, and the spirit has is, is literally working through the word. That's the D. The Spirit is working through the word that they just heard from the Apostle Peter, and the Spirit is working repentance. Right? So that's the result of the Spirit working in the word. Now, that's also going to drive us to look at other ways that God is going to give us his gifts in Christ Jesus, and that is going to be baptism. Okay? So the same Spirit that works through this word to convict their hearts of the law, right? The law will lead us to repentance. That's what they just heard from Peter. Now it's going to deliver to them gospel. Right. If he was an evangelical preacher of America, he would say, OK, repent and ask Jesus into your heart. Matter of fact, that's that's what they think the text says. If you listen to them talk about it, they're like, well, repent is something we must do. So the next thing is something we must do. And there's no, no, no. Repentance is the result of them being convicted by the law. Yes, the spirit is working repentance in their heart. Absolutely. They've heard the word of God and it is condemning them. That's exactly right. And we believe that that's something you should, that's a proper response from hearing the law, right? The spirit does that, right? And then and then, how do you get gospel? Repentance is just killing you. What do you do to get life? Shocker, Peter says, be baptized. He doesn't say, ask Jesus into your heart. He doesn't say, fix your sinful life and God will love you eventually. He says, be baptized. So what do we do? We believe that through baptism, God does gospel. Right? And he saves people. That's exactly what this is. And just case you're wondering, this is Acts 2, 36 to 38. That's where that's all written. Okay? So that's how we read it. We're not, we're not saying, oh, this is our action, therefore this is our action. We say, no, this is the result of hearing the word and being convicted by the law. And this is now how God is going to gospel these people. It's the Spirit's action in us. Yeah. From the Word. So it's the Spirit driving us to repentance, and then it's the Spirit's going to work in baptism. So it's not our 
or even receive. Not even our repentance. It's the Holy Spirit. Yep. Now the but word receive is open. It was oftentimes in turn. That's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, but I'm telling you, this is this would be consistent with the rest of the New Testament. This is actually how the rest of the New Testament talks about this whole thing happening. The other way I'm telling you, it's just not in the Bible. We're like, we're, we're sticking to the text. It says right here. It's like, okay, so where's your sinner's prayer? Where's your acceptance? Where's your asking you to do your heart? It's not in there. You're just making stuff up. We're actually just reading the text and let the text actually do what it says. Oftentimes when people do this, they're only looking at one side. They have forgotten original sin where their right. will is bound to right. reject all of this. Yeah, exactly. That's the only action to reject this. It is God's work here to bring us through this stuff. See, without without the spirit working in the word, they wouldn't have been cared, they wouldn't have been concerned about being saved. They weren't concerned about being saved. They were good. It wasn't until the word actually confronted them, the spirit drove them to repentance where they actually came before God and said, I need to be saved. See, in their concupiscence, they thought they were fine. And that's part of the problem of witnessing, is that you are actually walking up to people who think in their original sin that they're fine. So when you say God saves you or God loves you or God has done this for you, their, their first reaction is, I don't need that. Right? So sometimes it just takes hearing the word, the spirit just continues to work with the word, even to bring it to the point of needing to be forgiven. Right? Now, I know it's confirmation. we got to get going so you guys can get good seats and stuff like that. Um, so there you go. We got through three, kind of. We'll get there. All right, let's pray. We'll go. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are yours. We are your children because you have claimed us to be so. All praise and honor and glory to you for that and for all good things. Teach us to live our lives in joy for all the good things that you have done. In Jesus' name. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.